Good morning and peace to you. I hope all is well with you this Sunday morning as we gather via video. It's been a pleasure finding new ways to connect to you. Obviously, we are talking more by phone, but I am especially finding great joy in our weekly Zoom prayer services at 6.30 um, p.m., led by our own sister, Jan Seacrest. It feels good just to see your faces, even if it's on the computer screen. I encourage you to log on. I am also thankful for your continuing giving of your tithes and your offerings and your gifts. It not only maintains our bills, but it gives us the financial grounding to imagine the new ways that we can do church together, creatively and especially safely. Today we'll be talking a little bit about Paul, but first let us hear the song, This Little Light of Mine. This Little Light of Mine. It's a simple song. And even as you heard the instrumental just now, undoubtedly, you were taken back to probably your childhood where you learned the words that were put to that melody. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, and let it shine. And history has it that a gospel songwriter named Harry Dixon Lowe's wrote it back in the 20s. Other traditions, of course, describe it as an African-American spiritual, especially as it was adopted and then adapted by the civil rights movement as a rallying song, as was the case with many other spirituals. Though this is all interesting historically, I wanna go back and talk about how this seemingly simple song also discloses some complexity. Why? because it is not always simple to let your light shine. In fact, sometimes it is simpler to hide. Sometimes it is simpler just to turn inward, especially in times of crisis. There's a tendency to just kind of keep calm and carry on. But this gospel message of mercy and love that has a hold within our hearts dynamically defies a story that is simply static and stoic. No, it is an Easter story of the irrepressibility of life itself that wants to be shared, that wants to speak, even as a light from the sun wants to shine. One of the early leaders 
of the Christian tradition was Paul, the author of most of the epistles in the New Testament. Today we'll be reading a story from the 17th chapter of Acts and how Paul allowed the gospel message to speak through him while in Athens. We'll touch on how that can be relevant for us today. Let's hear the text. Today's scripture reading comes from the New Revised Standard Version Bible. The Book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 through 33. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the time of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. He has fixed the day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, We will hear you again about this. At that point Paul left them. The Word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. When I read the story that takes place in the first century Athens, I was taken back to my visitations to another first century Greco-Roman city just north of Amman, Jordan. The name of this city is Jerash. It is one of the best preserved cities that was inhabited during Paul's time and was undoubtedly a city that Jesus visited during his ministries east of the Jordan in the Decapolis. Like in the story of Paul in Athens, you can see all throughout Jerash the remains of temples and niches along the roads that were dedicated to servicing gods and goddesses. They are all over the place. And scripture says that it distressed Paul. In fact, if you look at the word used for distress in the original Greek, a better translation would be that it irked him, especially as a Jewish Christian who grew up saying the Shema, the Lord our God is one. Polytheism and graven images abounded and as the ancient historian Petronius once famously said of Athens, it is easier to find a God there than a man. Altars and shrines and temples were everywhere to Zeus and Athena and Ares and Mars, Jupiter, Venus and more. And this is how Jerash is set up as well. There's a temple to the Greek goddess of Artemis and is built prominently in a high point of the city. I think I even have a close-up selfie with that structure. This picture that you see right here shows a large portion of the ancient city of a thousand columns, as it was called. In this, what you see in the middle is the Oval Forum, which was a place where the public came together for commerce, for entertainment, and debate. The text has Paul speaking in the local synagogue, but he is also shown debating in the public place 
called the market or the agora in Greek, the hub or the place where people gathered, like here in this Oval Forum. These were the places where the philosophers philosophized. And in Athens, this was a place where Paul was unafraid to let his light shine. So Paul proves himself to be an intellectual heavyweight, even using the Greek forms of rhetoric. Some were convinced and others not. But he was impressive enough to get invited to Mars Hill, the Areopagus, the place where the Supreme Court of ancient Greece gathered. There, Paul engages the world and lets his light shine. And as a pastor, I stand in awe by this fine example of brilliant contextual and adaptive preaching. He finds a way in by saying, Athenians, and I'm paraphrasing, I see how spiritual you are. I see the richness of your religious life by all your shrines and temples and idols. Then scripture says, Paul says, for even as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And he continues, the God who made the earth and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth. And as I read Paul's evocation of creation and the God who created all things, which is a universal theme that unites all people, I thought of Psalms 19, which reads, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. You see, Paul's genius when in an environment where he was engaging those who were different than him was that he found this place of commonality. Not only does he quote the Athenian poets and uses Greek rhetorical devices, but he bridges the gap to get to a point of empathetic connection to ultimately affirm that we are, as he puts it, God's offspring, and that in God we all live and move and have our being. You know, the truth of the matter is that we may not have the eloquence of Paul's tongue. We, we may not be called to give an answer to our faith in the debate halls of academia or even in the halls of the Supreme Court. But we can let our lives speak to tell the story of the gospel that lives in us, a gospel that seeks to engage a world even though there might be people who are different than us. You know, I love the quote that is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. He says, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. This means that there is more than one way to spread the love and grace that is contained within the gospel message. In fact, there is another way that is made explicit within our own Methodist traditions, a tradition that privileges that which is practical and effectual. John Wesley explains it best when he says, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. This doing good is letting your light shine. It is letting the gospel speak through you. And it can be a gesture, grand or small. I mean, it is the phone call that you place to someone who you haven't talked to in a while. It is a letter to that person who you know doesn't have a computer. It's the yard work that you do for someone who you know might be still shut in. It's the lattice arch that you construct in a garden. It's the stories that we create and share over social media. It's the food that we cook for those in need. If you imbue that good act with the intention of wanting to reveal who God is, 
Like how Paul was inspired on Mars Hill long ago, God will take that little light of your good act and make it shine. You know, doing good gestures, even the little things, is not hokey. It allows people to feel, especially in times like this, that they are connected to something greater than themselves, that they are being held in a big, infinite truth that is larger than the finite circumstances. And it can create a spark that allows people to work for a just world where the dignity of all people is fought for and honored. And yes, as it says in the text, not everyone is going to believe in the particularities of the Christian religious tradition. Not everyone is going to find the same soul resonance with the story of the resurrected Christ as a gravitational center of their life of faith. I mean, even with Paul, as he got to the end of the sermon, it says that some believed and some scoffed. All that I believe is God's concern. Our work is to know that it is in God that we all live and breathe and have our being, that we are all God's offspring, sisters and brothers in humanity. And our response to that awareness that is almost too wonderful to grasp is to allow the light of God's love to shine through us and engage the world despite our differences, allowing our good words to speak as if they were the stars. You know, in conclusion, in, in the spirit and solidarity with our Muslim sisters and brothers who are in the process of fasting and celebrating during the holy month of Ramadan, I want to offer the words of the great Persian poet named Hafez. He was born in Iran in the 14th century, and his words are ubiquitous in that country and in that region. In fact, along with Rumi, Hafez is one of the world's most beloved mystic poets in the Sufi tradition. As we talk about allowing our good deeds to speak for us as we engage the world or letting our light shine, I'm reminded of Hafez's beautiful words when he writes, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. Indeed, our good deeds speak, and it lights up the whole sky. And this church has been and will continue to be a church of sky lighters through the good deeds that we do. Whether it shows up like those who have and continue to ensure that our Monday feeding program meets, it, man, meets its mandate to create a world where none go hungry, or those who partner with groups like Prosper Placer to advocate for marginalized groups and at-risk population, the skylight of those who've gathered behind the building with the big red doors on the corner of Washington and Church in Roseville still shines even as we do not gather in person in the building itself. Whether it is making prayer shawls or now face masks or making sure that the mental and emotional and spiritual health of our congregational community is maintained by making phone calls and fostering networks of connection through conversations in our touch care program. Please know that all of this matters, especially now. Your good deeds, whether proffered in the public square or offered in secret, are like the heavenly witnesses in the firmaments that the psalmist spoke of day by day and night by night, that which testifies to the presence of God in this world. And in this peculiar time, filled with anxiety and angst, division and death, fretting and fear, allowing the light of your good deeds, the big and the small, to shine, not only offers hope in the present, but it offers hope for a future of health and wholeness and joy for those who will come after us, including our children and our children's children. May what we do today speak, and speak of a God who is not only good, 
but a God that is knowable as Paul so ably testified. And may our lives, both individually and as a church, be a living invitation for everyone seeking to experience the divine grace that is available and accessible to all people, a grace that transforms the world. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we offer to you the prayers of our hearts, the prayers for our families and homes, the prayers for our communities and cities, and the prayers for our nation and world. With all of our prayers, even in this time of dealing with the coronavirus, we know that you continue to walk with us in all circumstances. In gratitude, we affirm that your grace is always sufficient and we are comforted in the awareness that it is in you that we live and move and breathe and have our beingness. May we allow our light to shine, and through your power, may our good deeds be for the world that which testifies to the hope of your known presence. Pray this in your holy name. Amen. And now, as you go with God, and as you go in God's peace, may you be encouraged by the song, The Blessing, as sung by people from all across the country of South Africa. Enjoy. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace.
may his favor be upon and the thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children take a little my benawe nezizuko baneza kono sabongako nabantwana nezizuko baneza bo tikele my benawe nezizuko baneza kono sabongako nabantwana nezizuko baneza bo may his presence go before you and behind you and beside